I want to welcome everybody here today for training on a new CPAP device that's presented by Mercury Medical. My name is Steve LaCroix. I'm the director of EMS sales. I've been with Mercury Medical about six and a half years. Prior to my time at Mercury, I spent 30 years with St. Petersburg Fire and Rescue as a paramedic, and I've also been a respiratory therapist for almost 40 years. In my time, we have seen a lot of different changes in how heart failure and difficult breathing patients have been treated. I can even remember a time when we used to put rotating tourniquets on patients' extremities, kind of an archaic treatment. If you've never heard of that, next time you go to a retirement party, talk to the old paramedics and respiratory therapists and you'll see what I'm talking about. To understand CPAP, one of the things that we have to have a few definitions here. CPAP, in the purposes of this video, is continuous positive airway pressure with one level of pressure. As compared to what we're gonna call bi-level, some of you may have heard BiPAP, that's a trademark name, but those names are interchangeable. Bi-level is a form of CPAP where you have two levels of pressure. It's important for everybody to remember to be successful. The thing to remember is that you need to follow your protocols, your SOPs, and your policies written by your medical directors. Second, you need to be able to pick out the right patient. Some patients are candidates for CPAP, some are not. Some are in respiratory distress, some are in failure. So it's important that you know the distinction between the two. So as we work through this, we're gonna go a little bit into history. We're gonna show you, or I'm going to be showing you, some of the previous versions of FlowSafe. FlowSafe has been around for several years, quite a number of years at this point. It is a dis totally disposable CPAP device, and all of, over these last couple of years, we have had several new generations. There is the FlowSafe 2, there is FlowSafe 2EZ, and there's gonna be the newest one that I'm gonna show you, which I think you're gonna be amazed at a totally disposable bi-level device called FlowSafe 2 Plus. Now, all of our FlowSafe products, and this is an example of a FlowSafe 2, have some things in common. How they create the pressure is by attaching to a flow meter or regulator, using the gas flow to create the pressure, whether it's an inspiratory pressure or even the resistance. So as the gas comes through the oxygen tubing and comes through the device, it creates a pressure that helps a little bit as far as the inhalation side of the respiratory cycle, and it also creates the resistance to giving you the exhalation pressure uh, for what we would call almost like an EPAP, which I'll explain shortly. The other thing that's incorporated in all versions of FlowSafe is they all have an integrated manometer. I, for one, as a clinician, would never want to put somebody on an airway pressure that I could not only document, but I can see what that pressure uh, is all about. And I'm gonna expand a little bit as we work through this. The other thing that they all have is a pressure pop-off valve. A pressure pop-off valve is more of a safety feature that allows, if there's any excessive pressure, it's gonna be vented so that we're not causing any harm. This is all of them also are considered what we would say to be an open CPAP device. What I mean by that is, as you can see in the blue cap here, there's holes and all of our flow state devices are open. The value of that is to be able, if you run out of a gas supply, the patient is able to breathe. It also entrains and brings in a certain amount of room air into the, uh, along with the oxygen that's powering the device. So this is a, what we call flow safe too. But before looking at the individual devices, I think one of the most important things about any success of CPAP is the patient interface. And in this case, it's gonna be a mask. This is Mercury's Deluxe Mask. If the mask doesn't get a seal, and that's usually one of the biggest complications, and if anybody's ever worn one where you wear a, a CPAP or a bi-level device for sleep apnea, if the mask doesn't seal, it doesn't work. The advantage of Mercury's Deluxe Mask is on the inside, there's actually a double seal that you can see that I'm holding on to each one, which makes it very easy to get a seal. We have to remember that masks need to be airtight. They don't have to be skin tight, so this is very comfortable. I can tell you from experience, patients that are not comfortable rarely will ever be compliant with such a device. So we have to have a good seal and it has to be compliant. This mask also comes with a very comfortable head harness that's elastic, it's got Velcro attachments, so we have unlimited adjustments of what's going on. This mask comes in three sizes. Generally, you have a label that will be on the nose piece, 
we have a large adult, we have a small adult, which also is considered a medium, and we have a child mask. Another great advantage of this mask, a lot of these patients that if we're treating them with heart failure or other types of uh, respiratory diseases, you have to gain access to their face on occasion. A lot of masks have to be totally disconnected, taken apart, so that you can gain access to their face if you want to give them nitro, say, for a heart failure patient. In this case, we have these blue connectors. There's one on each side that easily come disconnected. You can raise it up, give the patient the medication or whatever you would need to do, and then you attach it back. On the front of the map, mask, there are some black nipple connections. Now, a lot of people are going to ask, well, what are those for? Well, I can tell you that in other countries that I've noticed, uh, in Europe, Australia, uh, some of the South American countries, they are a little bit more concerned with the oxygen percentage than what we see in the U.S. Personally, I believe they're a little bit ahead of the curve than what we're seeing. So what they do is they power their CPAP devices off of compressed air or a compressor, which would be 21% oxygen percentage, and then they might titrate a little bit of oxygen in through where these nipple connectors are. In the U.S., I have found that the physicians and the medics and the respiratory therapists aren't as concerned about the oxygen concentration coming to their patient since FlowSafe is powered at this point by a oxygen cylinder or oxygen on the wall. Now, that does not mean that you could not use a blender and then you can titrate your oxygen percentage uh, however you'd like. But remember, I mentioned earlier that this is an open system. So if I've got holes here, even though I'm powering it through the oxygen gas flow, I'm going to get some room air. We know in the FlowSafe 2, the oxygen percentage, when it was tested for the average adult patient that might be, say, a tidal volume of 500, a respiratory rate of 12, is going to have an oxygen percentage somewhere around a 74 to 75%. Now, you cannot predict exactly what it's going to be for any individual patient. And what I tell people, and we're all familiar with the, the famous swimmer, uh, Michael Phelps, uh, I was able to look at what his uh, physical capabilities are. He has an unusually high tidal volume, which means he takes extremely deep breaths, probably a good ability if you're going to be a swimmer. If I put Michael Phelps on this device, his tidal volume is so large, he's going to pull more room air in through the holes. So his oxygen percentage would be somewhere lower. I find this an advantage for our patients out there as we treat them. The oxygen percentages will start to decline as they're able to take deep breaths, whether we're using medications, we're using our CPAP device, so it's an, uh, an automatic titration or lowering the FiO2. Uh, I believe in the future we're going to have to come up ways to alter the FiO2 for certain conditions and medical uh, backgrounds and problems that some of our patients have. So that's our mask. Now, I mentioned the manometer in the beginning, and I really think it's just critical to understand the advantage and the value of having a manometer. And not every CPAP device has a manometer. But for me, if I'm going to put, like I said earlier, if I'm going to put pressure on somebody's airway, there's always some negatives. I could collapse a lung, high pressure drops patients' blood pressures uh, because it reduces their preload. So it's significant harm that can be caused while we're trying to do something helpful. Everything in medicine has a risk-benefit ratio. I'm willing to risk something to, to get a benefit. So most people understand that pressure, and it's measured in centimeters of water. Uh, they understand the value of that, but sometimes this manometer is telling us a lot of information if we pay attention to what it's telling me. The first thing it's going to tell me, if it's not registering, then my mask is not giving you a seal. So if I turn the pressure on, and I'm running the flow, and I've got it on a patient, and the needle is still sitting on zero, it's telling me right away that I don't have a seal. And in EMS, and in some emergency departments, the noise, the ambient noise that you may have in your environment, you might not hear a leak coming from a mask. So the visual cue is going to be in the manometer. Probably the most important component of the manometer 
is understanding gas flow. A lot of medics, I'm hoping respiratory therapists understand it, is the patient has to have a peak flow. And what I mean is the gas velocity moving towards the patient needs to be fast enough to meet their demand. A as an example, uh, some of you may have seen some of the disaster uh, headlines even back far in September 11th or the hurricane, and you see the responders with a filter mask on their face. It's called an N95 mask. After a while, if you watch those news clips, you'll see that the mask is no longer on their face. It's on the top of their head, or it may be their neck where they've dropped it down. And people ask, why did they do that? It, it's not really because they're hot, but they're having to pull that air now through a filter. And they've got to work harder to pull it at the same speed they always do without the mask on. That's called peak flow. So they get a start to get a sensation of shortness of breath, and then they take it off. Imagine that with your patient who has emphysema, heart failure, asthma, a near drowning, allergic reaction. They've got to work harder to get that air coming towards them. And if the device does not provide it fast enough, every time they inhale, this manometer is going to drop to zero. That's a visual clue that your device is not meeting their demand. And I just think that is, it's, it's a huge concept to understand why a device may be effective and why it's not. Why your patient will fight you. And I've seen people want to sedate a patient because they're fighting the device. It's not the patient. It may be the device is not set up correctly or the device that you may be using doesn't provide the gas flow fast enough. Now, on the FlowSafe 2, on all of our FlowSafe devices, there's a sticker on the end of the tubing that tells you what the gas flow will give you what pressure. Now, I tell people to use that as a guideline because sometimes regulators are not calculated, uh, calibrated the way they should. They're not adjusted the way they should be. So it's a safe to start out with a flow safe too that you're going to have about eight liters is going to give you five centimeters of water pressure. But once I get this on the patient's face, I may have to use more flow to actually get that. Now, those in the audience that may have just heard me say that eight liters is going to give you five of CPAP. Well, I can tell you eight liters is not enough gas flow for the patient in respiratory distress. These patients are going to need gas flows probably at about 65 liters per minute of forward velocity. And that's not volume, it's velocity. So how does FlowSafe do that? If I'm telling you it's only eight and the patient out here is going to need 65, how does that happen? Well, there's this, there's this gas law called the Bernoulli principle, basically, that is this gas, as it comes up through the device and comes through the valve, it speeds up. Now, imagine you're outside and you're watering your flowers in your yard and you've got your garden hose and you're spraying the water. But if you're like me and I want to wa uh, put water on the flowers on the other side of my yard, I might not want to walk over there. So what do I do? I stick my thumb over the end, right? and I shoot it farther and faster. I didn't go back and turn up the, the hose bib to get more water, but I changed the forward velocity of the water. It's the same thing here. So this is going to speed up and meet the patient's demand. So it's important that any CPAP device is able to do that. You know, so that, that's how that actually works. Because I've had people say, well, geez, eight liters a minute won't get it. And they're right, it won't. But in a device like FlowSafe, it does. Okay. So FlowSafe 2 has been out a while, uh, has been a, a very successful product. But one of the things that came about that we came back from the field from people like yourself is that a lot of times we like to give breathing treatments with these, for these patients. A lot of them are COPD patients, the long-term smokers, they're the asthmatics. And these patients are generally given Breathing treatments, and, and you may have seen those, people with the nebulizer, they got the nice lazy smoke coming out of it. So a lot of the medics said, well, can, can we incorporate giving a breathing treatment with FlowSafe? Well, with FlowSafe 1, if I want to do that, I basically have to put a T-piece between the device and put the nebulizer in between, and it works, and that works out fine, but the problem is I need two gas sources. 
In an EMS, they're generally carrying one into the patient's house. So they were having to delay their care to get them into the back of a transport unit or get them to the hospital for a second gas source. So why would we be delaying the care? So he says, well, why can't you just incorporate one? Why can't you just integrate a nebulizer into your flow safe too? Well, the engineers at Mercury Medical were able to do that. So we introduced the next generation of FlowSafe, which is what we call the FlowSafe 2 Easy. Now you can see it's basically a FlowSafe 2 on the top and a nebulizer on the bottom. The reason we call it the FlowSafe 2 Easy, we have the Easy Flow Nebulizer, which Mercury sells separately. We just con combine the two products. And you'll see it, it powers everything off of one gas source. We have a switch that can actually flip it from the nebulizer off. And with the nebulizer on, simply being able to do all the things that I would want to do that I would need a second gas source or tee something in. So the, the medics thought this was a great idea. It's a very popular with a lot of the medics out there that, that use FlowSafe. Now you have to remember though, if I'm going to put eight liters in here and I've got it in the off position, this is a FlowSafe too. But as soon as I turn the nebulizer on, some of my gas flow is being diverted to the nebulizer, so your pressure is going to drop. To compensate for that, that's part of the design. To compensate for that, I'm going to have to turn my gas flow up to the device to compensate for losing some over to the nebulizer. I've had people say, well, yeah, your, your, your pressure drops when I do that. Yes, you're right, that's correct, because we've taken some of the gas flow away. That's the advantage of having a manometer. Now I know what my pressure is. I'd like to maintain it, that same pressure. If, that, if five centimeters is working for a patient and then I put them on a breathing treatment, I'd like to maintain that five. Research will show you that your breathing treatments will be a lot more effective with CPAP pressure. You've got the airways open, the medications are depositing better into the lung, it's gonna be a much more effective treatment. And then when the medication is completed, it stops it's gone, it's, it's not in the bowl anymore, then you turn it back off and then adjust your pressure back down or adjust your flow back down to get the pressure you originally had. Now, most everybody in the audience has probably seen, maybe they've administered, maybe they've been the receiver of a breathing treatment uh, with a standard, just plain, what we call a small volume nebulizer or an acorn nebulizer. And you're used to seeing this nice lazy smoke coming out of it. Well, you're not going to see that with this. Now, remember what I was saying about everything speeds up? It's almost like a little jet engine. It's jetting the, uh, the gas out the end. That mist appears to go away. You don't see it anymore because of the velocity that it's traveling. So I have, I have people who will go to use it and say, well, geez, the nebulizer doesn't work. Well, what do you mean it doesn't work? I don't see the lazy smoke. I've even asked clinicians, well, did the medication go away? Well, yeah. Well, where do you think it went? Well, I didn't see it. So if, if you're not sure if it's working, all you have to do is you can pull the nebulizer down and then you'll see the nice lazy smoke coming out of there. But as soon as you put it back up in the jet stream, it goes away. Now, this is a continuous nebulizer. A lot of clinicians, especially medics, are used to the small volume nebulizer where you can put one or two pre-filled medications, whether you're using albuterol, Atrovent, a dual neb, it doesn't matter. You could put two or three. In the, in the easy flow nebulizer, you can put up to eight prefills. This treatment can last over an hour. It's a continuous nebulizer, which research will show you that continuous nebs are generally better than repeated small volume nebs because you get the therapeutic level of the medication stays consistent. So we have found by combining these two products, we get the next generation, and for those that are out there that are considering looking at these, look at your protocols. Do I give a lot of breathing treatments or do I not? Do I want to have that option? Do I want to carry maybe both products for those that would need breathing treatments and those that would not? So um, great product, does everything that, that I think most people are looking for in a CPAP device. Now. For those devices out there, there, there's one thing that's been missing in the market for years. In addition to CPAP, you remember I said single level pressure, the bi-level is the 
dual level, levels of pressure. There's an inspiratory pressure and an expiratory pressure. I want people to realize that CPAP, A, doesn't cure anything. CPAP doesn't help you breathe. CPAP makes the work of breathing easier. Simple concept, but very important. Where a bi-level device helps you do the work. It helps you breathe. Now, a lot of medics out there are going to think that bi-level is better because every time they get to the hospital, the doctors change them to bi-level. Well, then it must be better. That's not actually true. They're different. They're going to do different things, generally for different patients. You have a hypoxic difficulty breathing, which is generally a CPAP candidate. You can have a hypercapnic or high CO2 difficulty breathing, which is more for a bi-level. But if you think about it, a lot of your patients don't call you at the first sign of a problem. They've waited all day. They're going to call you at night when they can't sleep, so they're going to make sure that you can't sleep. They're going to call you out, but they're running out of gas and they're getting tired. They have probably reached the point where they need the help that a CPAP device cannot offer. So why aren't you carrying a bilevel device now? They're out there. You see them in the hospitals. Generally, you don't see a mini EMS because it's capital piece of equipment. A bi-level ventilator can be as much as a $15,000 item. Trust me, I don't believe you're going to find that on, on your transport units or in EMS. But that's about to change. Mercury Medical has developed the first and only totally disposable bi-level device on the planet. And we want to introduce what we call FlowSafe 2 Plus. Now you can see, if you compare it to a FlowSafe 2, they're dramatically different. Obviously to the eye they look, geez, this looks very complicated. Trust me, it is not. One of the advantages of all FlowSafe devices, it only has two parts. Most everybody knows where the mask is going to go, and the device goes here. There's no other way to put it together. You, you can't get it wrong. It comes in a very compact packaging so that it fits into your first end bags, uh, easy to store, uh, whether you're storing it in a hospital, storing it on your vehicle. So, and then people look at it and they say, boy, that looks like it would really be heavy. And it looks, it looks like it might be. Trust me, it's not. It's actually a very light device. The difficulty in developing a bi-level device, and I want you to think about this, is that you have to have a device that knows whether the patient is inhaling or is exhaling. How do I do that? A lot of those devices have sensors. They have electronics. They have flow diverters and know whether the patient is inhaling because valves change. You're not going to find any of that on the bi, uh, our bi-level device, on the FlowSafe 2 Plus. There's no uh, sensors, there's no batteries, there's no electronics whatsoever to do that. So how does that happen? I, I was pretty amazed when the engineers called me down and they said, we think we've got this figured out. They took a very complex problem and came up with a very simple solution. It was absolutely amazing. Uh, now, it's very, it might be difficult to see on the camera, but there's actually a pink area right here. And what that pink area is, is basically the hub of a needle. The needle kind of points in this direction towards this blue block. That needle has the jet stream going through it. When a patient inhales, it points in one direction, and when they exhale, it points in a different direction. By directing the flow into this block, which has two holes, it goes to one of these two diaphragms, which changes the pressure. It's all mechanical. The patient does it. So we took this thing, it was like everybody's trying to figure out how do we do this and then keep it to where it would be disposable, where people would be throwing it away. That was what everybody wanted. So every doctor that we have talked to, that's what they want. They want a bi-level device. The medics, they want bi-level device. Respiratory therapists, if you go to a hospital and they look at their uh, number of bi-level ventilators, they don't have that many. What do we do during flu season that we're going on right now when we run out of machines? What do we do? Now, I'm not going to try to tell you that this is the same as a bi-level ventilator. It doesn't have a backup rate. It doesn't have any alarms. There's no timed rate. 
It has none of that. So it's not replacing a $15,000 ventilator. But it does more than what a plain CPAP device does. It's that gap patient that goes between CPAP and being on a ventilator. That's the patient that we're looking at here to do that. So not only does this do bi-level, this is also a CPAP device. You have a switch here that you can change it from bi-level to CPAP. So you're basically getting two devices in one based on what your patient needs, and it can be brought to the patient's side. So it comes with the deluxe mask, and we greatly recommend that it's used with the deluxe mask. We have found that other masks that may not seal as well is going to impact how well the product actually works. So the deluxe mask is extremely important to do that. Now you'll notice that it does not have an integrated nebulizer like a FlowSafe 2EZ. The only way to do a breathing treatment or a nebulizer treatment, you would have to do it like a FlowSafe 2 and put a T-piece in between and do your nebulizer that way. But you can only give a breathing treatment while it's in the CPAP mode. If you add the extra flow from a nebulizer while it's in the bi-level mode, it kind of tricks the device and it won't function as, as it's needed. As you do this, and we're going to demonstrate this in, in just a few minutes, it's very important that you follow some exact steps or the device will not function as designed. But there's a couple of things you need, a couple of terms you need to understand. IPAP is the inspiratory positive airway pressure, and the EPAP is the expiratory positive airway pressure. Remember, this is going to have two, so you're going to have an IPAP and you're going to have an EPAP. A typical order for bi-level that a physician may write that may be in your protocol, they're going to give you two numbers. They're going to give you commonly a good place and safe place to start would be a 10 over 5. 10 is your IPAP. That's your inspiratory pressure. The smaller number, the 5, will be your EPAP or expiratory pressure. Another term is called pressure support. Pressure support is the delta, the difference between those two numbers. The advantage of being able to do this and how it helps the person breathe. Remember, CPAP doesn't help you breathe. It makes the work of breathing easier. Bi-level helps you breathe. So how it does this, when it clicks from the EPAP of 5 to an IPAP of 10, that little kick helps the patient inhale. So it helps them do the work. The lower resistance that they're exhaling against also makes their life better because it reduces the work of breathing. Some people believe that all of the patients that would CPAP could probably be on a bi-level. I'm not sure I would really want to travel down that path. I think we need to know which of these patients are better for a CPAP device. Remember I mentioned the, the hypoxic. Generally, these are your heart failure patient type, type folks as compared to your COPD five-pack-a-day smoker are probably more of a hypercapnic. Use your entitled CO2 to monitor that. Use your pulse oximetry to monitor that. Now, I just mentioned entitled CO2. For all of the flow safe devices, there's two ways you could try to measure entitled CO2, whether you want to do capnometry, which is a number, or capnography, which is a graph. If you tried to use the connector for entitled CO2 that goes on an endotracheal tube, it will actually fit between the flow safe valve and the mask. It would fit in, the, in between the two. But I can tell you that's not very effective. The gas flow going through the valve is so fast, it washes the CO2 out, so therefore your graph is not going to be uh, of any value. For those that look at EKGs, your graph will end up looking like a coarse V-fib. Clinicians will know what that is, and that's of no value to you. Your number, your capnometry, would probably be a little bit lower than expected, but could be used for trending. The correct way, I believe, and, and the, the most accurate way to measure entitled is to use the cannula-style entitled CO2 gas lines. It would go under the mass, so you've got to think about it as you go to apply this. It's got to be on the patient beforehand, obviously 
And because of the, the good double seal on the mask, the tubing coming out of it from the gas line well, doesn't appear from everything that we've gotten feedback from the field and from what I've personally seen, does not create a problem. I believe all of these patients should be on entitled CO2. So make it part of your protocol, make it part of your practice, is to go ahead and get that cannula on as you're going through the process to put it on. So that's, there's a couple of other options that we have with, with FlowSafe. One of the things that comes into play, as I mentioned earlier, a lot of times in other countries, they don't like the high oxygen percentage that patients are getting. Uh, we're seeing a little bit of that in the U.S. We've had some people that are interested in it. So we came up with a 35% FiO2 elbow that can go into the mask. So if this is placed into the mask and the valve is placed on the end, you actually have an additional hole here that's going to bring in some room air. So if you're going to mix another uh, percentage of 21% into your gas supply, so it's going to give you a, a average for the average patient right around 35%. If you remember I said earlier, without that valve, it was going to be somewhere around 74 to 75 so that there would be an, an advantage there for those that are concerned about the FiO2 that they're giving the patient. Now, for the EMS folks and for the people in the ER, a lot of times if your EMS agency is using FlowSafe and they get to the hospital, and the patient just is not doing as well as, as, as you would like, and they're going to put them on a, 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 a V60 or a Vision, some type of a, a bi-level ventilator, typically they have to throw away the flow safe device, throw the mask away, which is already fit on the patient, working fine, got a good seal, and it seemed like kind of a waste because now they're going to need about a $25 to $30 mask, which they generally cannot bill for, so what do you do? The problem with, with this setup is those ventilators require a vented mask. This is a non-vented mask. And I know it's not a concern to, to EMS folks in general, uh, but it is part of the cost. But it is a concern to the respiratory therapist to have to go back and fit a mask on a patient to get a new seal, may type several masks to get that accomplished. So you, there is a way to turn this into a very close version of a vented mask. You need two things. You have to have an anti-asphyxia valve, which this does not have, and you've got to have a, a valve that is able to flush the CO2 out of the mask, which this does not have. Because remember, I told you this was an open system, so it doesn't need any of those things. But the other devices the hospital use does. So we have a different valve that can actually be placed into the mask, Generally, hospitals purchase these because they're trying to turn this mask to be acceptable in, in the ventilators that they have. And the circuit that they use will have the flow valve that will flush out the CO2. And then the respiratory therapist knows how to deal with it. So instead of scrapping everything that was just done, they could use this to use it to the equipment that they have in the hospital. So it, it is an advantage to have that but somebody's got to go in and, and tell them about that. What we're hoping is that that group of patients between CPAP and a ventilator will do fine on a FlowSafe 2 Plus and they won't have to use the more expensive device. Some of these patients don't need that level of capability. And to use this device, you don't need to be a respiratory therapist. For those other devices, you really should be a respiratory therapist. They go to school for years to manage the, the complexity of those devices. This is a very simple, easy device to use. So I think everybody's going to be pleased with this performance and, and how well it works. Now, with all that said, the next step is I'd like to move into demonstrating FlowSafe 2 Plus. Okay, the next step in our process of going over the FlowSafe 2 Plus is actually show how to demonstrate it and how to set it up. Now, I want you to remember that these patients are in distress. They're not in failure. You do have some time to do this. It's not like you're going to be doing CPR. You're not ventilating these patients. Remember, we've got to get this right. There's important steps to do this. One of the greatest factors in the success of CPAP is not always the device. It's the clinician. It's the coaching, how do you work for them, 
How do you work with them? Remember, these patients are probably having the worst day that they've had. They've been short of breath, they're working hard, they could be confused, they could be hypoxic, short of oxygen, uh, and just really are having a rough time. So coaching is huge. So I'm gonna introduce my, my patient here. This, this is Scott Horowitz. Uh, he's also works with me here at Mercury Medical. He's been kind enough to be the patient. So we're gonna demonstrate Flow Safe 2 Plus. As you remember when, we, when I discussed it earlier, is you've got to start out in the CPAP mode, which I've already done. It does come out of the package that way because we think that is so important that we do that. Now, I want you to remember that IPAP and that EPAP. When you have somebody in a CPAP mode only, single pressure, that is technically going to be your IPAP pressure, okay? So we're gonna start out in the CPAP mode so that we do that. Now, if I was going to be treating Scott here, he's gonna, he was gonna be my patient. I would be already, we've done some assessments. We've already decided this is the direction that we're gonna go. I'd be telling him this is what we're gonna do. This is gonna help you breathe. This is gonna make things easier for you. A lot of times I even like to kind of put a hand on somebody and you're talking to them. Clinicians have kind of gotten away from that. I think it's important that we develop a rapport between the caregiver and the patient. They're looking for you to solve a problem. What are our patients looking for us in EMS? I think there's really two things they're looking for. Generally, they want to arrive to the hospital and they want to feel better. And sometime, how I deal with people helps them feel better, okay? So to me, I would explain what we're gonna do. And I've got the mask here. I always tell people to invert the head harness. Don't walk in and just strap it on somebody's face. You do that and you're gonna, the anxiety level is gonna go through the roof. I always suggest is whoever gets a rapport with the patient, stay with them. You're the one that's working with them. Don't go off and write a report. Don't talk on the radio. Don't have a con conversation about the latest football game while this is going on. They'll get, they're gonna, anxiety levels are gonna get high. There's gonna be a problem. So I go ahead and I, I invert the mask. I put together, remember there's only two parts. It can only go one way. Now based on the sticker, since I've got this in CPAP mode, remember this is going to be a, like a flow safe too. Eight liters should get me five of CPAP. I always tell people to start low, work their way up. Five is a safe place. That's a safe zone. Generally, I'm not going to cause any harm to somebody by putting them on five of CPAP. So I'm going to turn the tank on here in a minute. I'm going to put it on eight. And I'm going to try to get Scott to hold it but I really want to get them on the device, have it functioning with a CPAP of five. So I'm gonna turn my, my tank is already on. I'm going to turn it up to eight. Now you, you might be able to hear some of that sound. It does get a little bit noisy, but every CPAP device gets noisy strictly because of the gas flow. So I always tell the patient, I try to get them to hold it. I want them to feel like they have some control in what's going on, and I try to get them to put it up to their face. Now, if they want to pull it away, that's okay. Remember, the patient's in distress. They're not in failure, all right? So if I can get him to put it up to his face and say that's all he'll do, he doesn't want the strapping, the device will work. But now I have to look at my manometer to see if it's actually working because the manometer will not register until it's got a seal on the patient's face. So I get that on there, I try to get him a little bit tighter and I actually have him on five, okay? Now, what I wanna do so that everybody on camera can see this, now this does not come with the FlowSafe device. This is for demonstration purposes only, but I'm going to put the larger manometer that you can see there on the table. Now you see, notice as he does that, I wanna see what you're actually getting there. We're right on about five. I would like the pressure to be a little bit more consistent, so I'm gonna turn it up. Now you'll notice the needle moves. It's not gonna stay exactly on the number because as you breathe, you're changing the intrathoracic pressure in your chest, so you're gonna have some fluctuations but I want a kind of a mean average right around five and I kind of like that. So once I get him to where he'll stay on it and everything's fine, 
Now I can take the head harness and bring it over. Always be careful of their ears. On the flow safe too, you want to hit that these pinchers here, which pulls it, makes that you'll notice that the forehead piece actually went to his forehead. And now I can actually use the four points that are Velcroed to actually where he no longer has to use his hands. You notice I think my pressure probably should still be staying around five, which we're doing pretty good. So now I know that I'm not, he's not over breathing it. It's not going to zero when he inhales. I got a good mass seal. It's registering, so I'm happy with that. Now I'm considered I want to go to a buy level. I want to go to two levels to do that. For this device, I recommend for it to actually work best, I'm going to make this a CPAP. Now remember, I'm not in buy level yet. I want to make this a CPAP of 10. So how do I do that? I'm going to turn my flow up. Okay. Once I've done that, I've got a CPAP of 10. That is your IPAP. That's your inspiratory pressure. It's now set. So when I flip this switch to buy level, okay, I still got my inspiratory right there. When he inhales up at the 10, you'll notice it's going down, but I really want it on a five. To adjust that, there's a little disc here labeled EPAP that I adjust that. Okay, so you'll notice I've got an average of 10 on the inspiratory and an average of 5 on the expiratory. He is now on buy level. It is helping him do the work. So it's a significant advantage to be able to do that. Now, if I wanted to do a breathing treatment, I would have to put it in line where my manometer is teed in now, but I would have to go back to the CPAP for this to actually work or we're going to fool the device. So this should make it much more comfortable for him to do that. To use FlowSafe 2 Plus, it's very important that we follow those steps as I outlined there. Start in CPAP. Start it at 5. Make sure your mask is not leaking. Make sure he's not drawing it down to 0. Then adjust your CPAP up to 10. If everything still stays fine, it's still not leaking, then you can flip your switch to buy level and adjust your EPAP. And that's really all there is to it. Now, maybe when they get to the hospital, you may have to explain to them what this is because we're, it, it's, it, this is really new and it's out there. And we're also looking at using an elbow in this location where the device is more straight down than coming straight out. That was an option that somebody, people could do. They found this to look a little almost like a the beak on a, on, a, on a bird or something, it looks kind of, kind of awkward, so you could actually do that. So that's the FlowSafe 2 Plus. This has been Steve LaCroix with Mercury Medical. If you have any questions, you can go to our, uh, our new website at uh, mercurymed.com, or you can send me an email. My email address is slacroix, that's L-E-C-R-O-Y, at mercurymed.com. I hope this has been helpful and very informational. Uh, look forward to hearing from some folks. Give it a try. You'll find this to be an excellent product, and I think your patients will be better for it. Have a good day.